Hello and welcome to a, another edition of The Consultants, a regular podcast piece where I pull together some of my consultants and we sit and talk about information security, what's going on at the moment, some of the changes that we're seeing, some of the details behind it, um, and all things InfoSec. Uh, my name is James Reese, as you probably already know by now. And to, with me, I have Tom Mills and Jamie Hayward. Tom, Jamie, do you want to say hello? Let's start with Jamie. Hi, I'm Jamie Hayward. I've been with Razor Thorn for about three years, but been in InfoSec for over 10. Tom? Uh, yeah, Tom Mills. Um, been with Razor Thorn for just over four months now. Uh, absolutely loving life, as everyone can probably imagine. Um, I've been in the information and security game for about 16 and a half years now. Uh, yeah, should be a, an interesting conversation. Fantastic. Yes, obviously we've we've all read, and probably all of you out there as well have read the fun and games that are going on with the re- various ransomware attacks. More hospitals have been done. More organisations have been hit, um, and it doesn't seem to be slowing down. If anything, it actually seems to be speeding up a bit. And w- us as a security community are seriously having to change our thoughts on defense in depth you know all of our defense in depth measures before were pretty much geared towards uh, supporting a, a single office or a group of offices uh, where everybody would come in and work and now that's not the case the the office perimeter has expanded to pretty much everybody's home everybody's front room um, people are using obviously their own wireless locally now um, in order to connect back into the office. Uh, there's quite a significant amount of change going on in our industry. I mean, what do you, what do you guys think about that? Who wants to start? Um, yeah, there's, 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 a lot of, there's a lot of things going on at the moment. And um, it's one of those things, it's, it's definitely scary out there. Um, I think defense in depth is definitely something that's going to become more and more relevant uh, in the in this industry. Um, ideally, it should have happened sooner, in my opinion. But, you know, defense in depth is definitely something um, where the industry is going. Um, we're going to need to layer uh, multiple technologies, processes, people over each other in order to protect uh, protect ourselves and uh, protect our critical assets, which is the whole point of information security. Tom, you're uh, you know coming out of the military, and I mean, what's what's the insight from from you know the military? I mean, there's there's two different entities to this. Um, I mean, obviously, one of them is the whole defence in depth. Uh, methodology that um, yes we're starting to see within the corporate world to, um, that are starting to actually like defense in depth and recognize defense in depth as um, as a recognized methodology to take forward within their structure um, but it's been used in the military for at least the last couple of decades um, I mean even 15 years ago when I was going out to, to minor units or major units to conduct their um, investigations to do their their audits, um, we weren't just looking at one security domain and doing the audit on that. We were looking at 11 different security domains, all the way from personal and personal security um, through to um, crypto security, down to physical security, even all the way up to, to arms and ammunition security. So um, all those levels obviously interact with each other and overlap in some way, shape or form. Um, so when we did an audit, we weren't just judging one specific domain on the criticality where we filled out a, a questionnaire form or a matrix form giving a, a risk score uh, or rating score to each of those domains and subdomains which then came out with the end product it came out with the end score and if they met a required score that would either pass or fail that audit you know what i mean then uh, further actions would be taken Obviously, conclusion and recommendations would be taken out of that and put forward to the unit to remediate any uh, lapses in control strengths. But they all work together. And I think this is something that the corporate world is, is starting to see is um, they shouldn't just be looking at their information security. They shouldn't just be looking at their physical security because it all comes together in this holistic approach of defence in depth. So it should all be monitored and work together because if one thing fails, the whole system fails. 
Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, it's, it's taken a long time for our industry, commercially speaking, to really get there. I mean, there was a lot of us that were talking about it for a long time. We used to call it the security onion. You know, each each of the um, slices of skin of, of, of onion would, would be a different countermeasure that you'd put in place with the, the organization's key assets kind of in the middle of it. And obviously that's change now. I mean, we tend to represent it on on, a, on an iceberg. Um, other people represent it in various other different ways. But I think one of the, the, the more significant changes, I mean, our tool set, I mean, we've, I've done podcasts about this recently with a variety of different people and, and people from different areas. You know, we have more tools and toys now in our industry than we've ever had in the past. And that's from you know, uh, the more defensive side of things, we've got SEAM, we've got uh, XDR, we've got MDR, we've got endpoint security, we've got intelligence solutions, we've got obviously the more traditional things like firewalls and, you know, so on and so forth. And, and but, but now we have such a plethora of tools at our disposal that, you know, there is no reason why we couldn't do proper defense in depth. I think Part of the problem I see is a lot of people are still running off this ancient sort of defense in depth or security onion model, um, still kind of concentrating on utilizing the more traditional security solutions. And a lot of it is solution based. Yeah, okay, you know, if they've got ISO 27001 or PCI DSS as a requirement or HIPAA or any of the other kind of main frameworks, then they have those security policies and procedures that, that, that puff that out. But a lot of organizations aren't required to kind of meet that kind of standard. They're still relying very heavily on technology. Um, and you can't do that anymore. I think that's pretty obvious when you look at some yeah, of the it, stuff that's been going on. And it moves it moves back into the whole kind of like trilogy, doesn't it, of like um, processes, people, and technology. You need all three to form that kind of um, defense in depth. Um, you need all, all three of those pillars to be as strong as each other. And, uh, and as, uh, going, also going back to your point about, um, the number of tools and solutions that we're, we've got at the moment, there's been recently, probably in the last 10 years, significant investment in solutions and technology. Obviously, people were seeing that these attacks were happening. They were, you know, there's been forecasts about you know, the global cyber security um, spending and all that type of thing. People have just plowed money towards vendors, solutions, technologies in order to produce those. So we do have the skill sets there at the moment, but you can't just rely on one of those three pillars. You can't just rely on technology. You have to rely on all three. And that's where you start. Not only are there kind of potential layers that you can put in from a technology point of view, like uh, I suppose the easiest example is email security, you, you know, email security, antivirus, and all those types of things, and layering a, an attack via from that vector. But you've also got to make sure that the your your personnel are trained, um, and you know they're trained to spot fish, uh, phishing emails or whatever that that might sneak through that technology because no technology is 100%. So not only can you actually layer technology on top of each other but you also have to look at layering technology with processes and the people and the training and awareness. Unless you're in marketing for one of these vendors in which case buy their tool and it will fix everything. Exactly. Um <laughs> you know I mean, a couple, of, a couple of stats I have come prepared, which is not a regular thing when I come to do these types of videos. Um, actually, I was, I was writing an article this morning um, and grabbed hold of a couple of, a couple of stats. So it's estimated by Cybersecurity Ventures. It's a, yeah, they do the Cybercrime magazine. Really, really good resource. Really nice people there. Um, they estimate that there's going to be a cost to $8 trillion to the world's economy in cybercrime. That's how much cybercrime is going to cost the economy in 2023. $8 trillion. Now, two or three years ago, that was $6 trillion. So it seems to be going up by, on average, a trillion, trillion dollars a year by the looks of it at the moment. Um, however, yeah, I was going to ask about the investment. <laughs> well, the investment, it's, it's a lot less. It's like the investment in protecting organizations, be it public, private, whatever, 
um, is only predicted between 2021 and 2025. Now, I don't know if this is yearly or whether this is for that time period, $1.75 trillion. We are spending next, you know, hardly anything compared to what the crime is costing us. Um, and whilst, you know, I do understand uh, that security, a lot of these security tools are quite expensive, and I still think it's because they're relatively new. You know, when you look at, for instance, if you look at the comparative cost of endpoint security, endpoint security when it was AV, and it only really did AV back in the day, was really expensive. 20 years ago, it was really expensive to get antivirus, but, but with all the viruses going on, you know, it was a captive market. You went out, you got your AV, whether it was Semantic, whether it was McAfee or Trend, there was, there was comparatively a lot less vendors in this space. Nowadays, endpoint security is really, really cheap compared to what it was 20 years ago. So I guess really what I'm, I'm saying is, you know, we've, we're facing a situation where we need more investment in this space for organizations to invest in this space. The, uh, comparatively speaking, most organizations who do have a security budget tend to target it at five, between five and 10% of their overall IT budget, 10%, you know, 10% being the top end. I think that's frightening. I mean, I, you know, obviously IT is a very expensive resource to build out and to manage and to maintain either operationally or, or you know, OPEX or CAPEX. But still, if we're spending next to, you know, next to nothing, if you've, according to those metrics, if you've got a million pound budget for um, your IT, you know, 100K for your security. I mean, that's one that's one scene product, if you're lucky. That's, you know, um, an endpoint security solution. And, and we're not even touching on the, the things, the snapshot in time stuff like penetration testing, vulnerability scanning, that kind of stuff. You're, you're literally, you're kind of hamstruck. Yeah, I mean, yeah. but that's the, that's the overall kind of security budget. I mean, yes, if you wanted to buy a SIEM solution, that would be your budget for the year. How do you then, you would have to obviously budget in, um, you know, cybersecurity people, people to run it, people to, well, people, you know. Well, pe people normally come out of a different budget, but yeah, you know, I mean, okay, let's put it into a different perspective then. You know, most GRC tools out there, for a company that, you know, where you've got a million pounds spend on IT, a good GRC tool, you're probably not going to get much change, even if you're lucky, out of 60, 70, 80K. I mean, I think... I, and that's, I that's, think over, that's over half your security budget. Half yeah, I've been, I've, been looking, I've been looking at GRC tools recently and everything else like that, and I've been going through um, some of the quotes I've been having. I think the smallest was 50K. For a GRC tool, um, this is based on around a thousand users, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but it's fit it is fifty k, and a lot of GRC tools won't necessarily um, go smaller than a thousand users. They will obviously sell it to a company that's got less than a thousand users, but their minimum price point tends to be about fifty k. Is the experience I've had, and yeah, some of the bigger boys in that area, and it's not just fixed to GRC tools. I'm not kind of like singling them out, but all vendors, all solutions, especially when you're talking seams and things like that as well. Yeah, you are completely correct. It's just, I mean, ideally, yes, it'd be great to have more. Um, and going back to the, the whole kind of investment, you know, percentages and things like that. The idea is obviously you have a risk. You may have, I mean, the, it's, it's one of the basics, uh, uh, basis of, of risk is you ha might have like a two million pound risk. And you think you can mitigate that two million pound risk down to, you know, a hundred thousand pound risk by a 50,000 pound investment. It makes sense, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you are fully covering yourself. I think we all can understand as a cybersecurity professionals that no, no company, no solution, no, um, you know, no setup, no even in defense in depth is 100%. It can never be 100%. There's always new things to be found.
Well, that's it as well. You know, you are right. You can't be 100%, but equally, you know, if you're not spending any any money on reducing reducing your overall risk, you know, if you're if you're if you're looking after a firm that's you know pulling in say a trillion pounds a year, you know, or you know 500 million pounds per year, then you know you've got a, you, you've got quite a significant amount of risk there. One ransomware attack and it could render the company completely dead. Yeah. So you're you know, and if you're only spending a hundred grand on your security, you know, it's like. Mm, yeah. I mean, another stat, one last stat before we go over to Tom, because I know he's desperate to talk. <laughs> um, the WEF, World Economic Forum, love them or hate them, think they're, you know, whether they're, you know, good or bad or whatever. Um, they actually list, you know, cyber attacks, cyber security issues on their two year forecast and their 10 year forecast as number eight. In the list of concerns that they have, you know, and we're talking next to climate change. We're talking next to um, cost of living increases. You know, the WF don't just look at you know specific types of risks. I mean, this is in their top ten of risks for the world. For the you know, not this is this is big. It's a big issue that we're not handling. Yeah, and I, I, I think because I, I, I think Tom's going to have some good insight in here, but um, I, I truly believe that you know, well, and we've seen part of it as well with the whole Ukraine and Russia thing. Um, there's been an increase of kind of Russian actors and things uh, and such like that because. Well, for many reasons, I'm not going to go too deeply into it, but for many reasons, there was an increase in Russian actors. Um, performing cybersecurity attacks at various targets around the world. We've seen it in some of our own clients. We've we've seen articles of it, and uh, even the kind of the ban that we discussed last time against Conti, and because that's a Russian group, and the um, uh, and the ban on paying those against the ransomware that they perform. Um, I think in the future, not only will there be wars of military action but there will be also a massive increase in cyber cyber warfare as well so do i think they're correct yes would i put it eighth i don't know that's a that's up to interpretation but tom i'm sure you've got some insight into cyber warfare I, I, only, only a little bit um I mean, go, going on to, to points that have already been raised, um, certainly when it comes down to budget allocation from IT, uh, IT departments into things like cybersecurity solutions uh, to help them through whatever accreditation processes or build up that level of defence in depth. Um, I think it's, it's quite indicative when you see in the news that a, a large organisation um, has been subject to a breach that suddenly they're investing uh, £10 million in cybersecurity. And it, it really emphasises the whole reactive versus proactive approach that organisations take. And it's something that we are starting to see a shift within the commercial world, um, that some entities are starting to take that proactive approach because they're seeing the level of impact that these breaches have. Um, now, whether that be just on a financial setting or whether it be from um, a, a loss of reputation or, or even some sanctions that are being um, started or starting to be imposed, um, that is going to limit their ability to deal with these types of breaches. And obviously, we spoke about that in a, a previous talk um, about how ransomware is, uh, attacks are going to be affected by certain threat actors. Um, so it's, we are starting to see a shift. Um, and obviously, moving on to the whole uh, the cyber warfare domain, I mean, just before I start going into it, there, there's two very good resources to, to dig into this. Um, Two podcasts. One, uh, the Centre of Army Leadership podcast. It's a fantastic resource. Uh, they have some very fantastic speakers on there, um, and some of them delve into the threat of, of the cyber domain. Uh, but also, you've got um, the Grey Zone podcast. I think it's a series of not nine or ten uh, episodes, and it is absolutely fantastic. Um, and I, I would encourage uh, anyone to, to listen into them because it really delves into the intricacies of, of the current threat that we're facing from a, a cyber domain 
Um, and the cyber warfare domain is actually now a, a recognized domain of warfare. Now, the complexities and considerations of it is, and obviously you spoke about it a little bit, Jamie, about we saw an increase of, of Russian-based threat actors um, either against Ukraine or even against um, UK-based organizations, is where there is a stopgap uh, or an inability to actually declare those as Russian state-sponsored actors is because it's, it's not officially deemed as Russian state actors because they're used through proxies. Um, they're not officially affiliated to, to the Russian state in any way, shape or form. It's not deemed as a an active um, act of war because we're also operating against... Uh, policies and legislation. The Geneva Convention is is one, and another international uh, regulations and legislations that define the context of of what warfare is. But they are solely set on land based warfare, not on cyber based warfare. So any act of cyber warfare, as it may be referenced in this day and age, hasn't actually got the backing of of what we're basing those those acts on. So. It'll be interesting to see what international organizations, uh, what future treaties and conventions are, are held to, to actually put uh, in place policies and procedures to, to protect even international organizations and entities against this type of thing. And whether a cyber act of warfare will be further defined in the future is it's, it's a very interesting time, but equally very worrying. But you make a good point there, you know, governments are starting to take it very, very seriously and the, the, you know, the subject of cyber warfare very seriously. And we're definitely seeing in um, the European Union, uh, the UK government and the US government, and no doubt a number of other governments as well, dotted around the world. Um, they're starting to look very closely at legislating uh, and creating additional or up-to-date frameworks for cybersecurity for both public and and private organizations and i think a lot of this is in answer to what we're seeing with the increase in attacks and some of the threats coming out of some of the regions that you guys have mentioned um and i think there's there's going to be a significant f- shift in focus from you know the more traditional security where it's kind of tool based with snapshots in time where we review things so you know traditionally when we were for instance reviewing a policy set, quite often that would be on an annual basis. Yeah, okay, if there was something glaring that you needed to change, then you'd change it. But on a whole, you know, if you look at most of the standards, ISO, PCI, whatever, um, it's kind of a let's review that policy set on a yearly basis or elements of it over the course of the year. But roughly roughly you'll find that that most of those policies are reviewed pretty much annually. Um, It's now shifting to this kind of idea behind continuous security and continuous testing. Um, We're seeing quite a big shift in that defense in depth stack now towards, well, we need to be able to tell at any one time how secure or how insecure we actually are, at least, or make us at least aware of what the issues are so we can either band-aid them or get some kind of fix to them. Because you're not going to be able to, to to operate in that traditional model for much longer. I mean, look at insurance. We, we kind of mentioned it at the beginning, cyber insurance. We've just had that, not just, I mean, it happened sort of last year, I think it was, um, Merck with that $1.4 billion payout from their insurance companies, you know, to take them to court for that. And funny enough, you mentioned, uh, you know, earlier on sort of like the definition of war and acts of war, you know, they were quite often cyber insurance you know, or insurance companies would give you a cyber insurance policy that stated in the event of you know, activity that attributed to, that could be attributed to some kind of act of war, you're not going to get a payout. And that's what they claimed for that particular case. Well, we all know how that one panned out because uh, I'm guessing there's a couple of insurance companies that don't exist anymore after having to pay out $1.4 billion, billion. But I'm getting a lot of reports now from the States that in order to do business with a lot of these big organizations, with the government and so on and so forth, um, because it's a bit of a different market out there, they're requiring you to actually have cyber insurance now. But then cyber insurance premiums are rapidly rising because of things like Merck and because 
I mean, there was that, that ransomware group. We talked last time, last episode about ransomware, so I don't really want to go back too far into it. But um, I posted it up on LinkedIn about that that group where they actively say, just you know, on the QT, tell us how much your cyber insurance policy will pay out and we'll, we'll set your ransom to that. You know, even though you're not meant to tell us, I, I, you know, I don't know how... <laughs> You know, but if 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 your payout is like ten million quid, tell us tell us it's ten million pounds, and then we'll we'll say okay, the ransom is ten million pounds or nine hundred ninety nine, you know nine 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 um, pounds just just underneath, um, and we'll set it at that, and then you can go on your merry way. You know, it's like it's not you. They actually cite in the the write up. Oh, it's not not you know the only people getting harmed in this is insurance companies anyway, and they deserve it kind of thing. I mean, I don't follow that particular thing myself, but, you know, this is where we're going. You know, continuous pen testing is a thing that's becoming a, a, a significant concern as well. Yeah, so the, I mean, the, the, the history of obviously pen testing is everyone thought, well, it's a good idea. You know, this, this penetration testing, you know, occurred like 15 years ago, came into foresight. A lot of people and a lot of industry didn't necessarily pick up on it straight away. And I remember the introduction of uh, penetration testing probably around, yeah, about 11 11, 12 years ago. Um, obviously, Razorthorn, we've been doing pen testing for almost as uh, just as long as that, if not longer. Um, and we've been offering those services. But to begin with, it was, it, it gave a massive insight, you know, even an annual pen test where, you know, that's where the recommendation was to perform an annual pen test. You get a snapshot in time. Um, you'll get the vulnerabilities, you can fix those vulnerabilities, and you will be able to sleep better at night, in essence. The more mature models started very quickly coming out of that within like a couple of years afterwards that they said, okay, but as well as doing pen testing, you should probably, you know, look at your secure development as well, get some vulnerability scanning tools or some code checking tools or code scanning tools and things like that to ensure that the code that you are then releasing into and uh, into the, the end products and everything else like that, you're not introducing developmental errors and things like that. So you don't necessarily uh, have to fix those when the pen test, because the pen test won't find them. So a much more mature model was, you know, test your code as you're releasing it and everything else like that, but still perform an annual pen test. So, I mean, that was kind of like where we've got to. And now it's morphed again. And it's, and it's definitely a much more mature model to then start looking at continuous pen testing, continuous scanning, you know, validate the results that are coming out of it on a continuous basis and try to, yeah, and just you can react a lot quicker. I mean, there was that whole adage of, I can't remember, there was a stat many years ago where people were saying, um, you know, the time, the time it took to detect that a hack had happened was in the months and years rather than in the days and weeks. Um, and they were tr constantly trying to bring that down. And I think continuous pen testing is a big fight against that. You can get, with continuous pen testing, you can, first of all, identify issues and vulnerabilities before someone is able to exploit it. And then potentially even at the same time with other tools that could be, you know, positioned alongside continuous pen testing, then you can, um, you know, we get that reaction time much, much quicker. And that's the idea behind this is trying to get the reaction time, I believe, down to a minimum and fix things and go to a more holistic uh, security model rather than a reactionary security model. Well, it, it works hand in hand. So where a lot of your solutions that uh, an organization may may look to in, uh, enact within their, their whole architecture, like Seam Solution is, is a, a blinding example because um, Seam obviously monitors your, your current network traffic. So it's specifically there um, to take in a lot of different data sources, analyze them, process them, and then generate an output to say, right, it, it is what is going on on your network normal, um, consistent with the normal business um, baseline. And that's absolutely great. And, and you can identify whether there's something abnormal going on as it happens. Again, it's an absolutely great tool. Um, now, where it comes to the situational awareness piece is where continuous pen testing comes in. 
and that feeds into cyber threat intelligence. Um, obviously, cyber threat intelligence, it's one of the new regulations or control measures that um, is being introduced to 27001 colon 2022, so the newest update. And I'm sure with the, the, the American counterpart, NIST, because they're doing a significant review of their framework at the moment as well, and they're uh, uh, looking to publish that relatively soon, I'm sure threat intelligence is probably going to be involved in that as well quite heavily. Um so where obviously continuous uh, pen testing comes in is it highlights where those potential vulnerabilities lie within your network architecture, whether it be your internal, external infrastructure, whether it be your web apps, mobile apps. Um, so that, yes, when that vulnerability becomes apparent, something can be done about it rather than waiting the two, three 10, 11 months until the next annual penetration test comes in, because then it's too late. You know I mean, you've potentially had a, a wide open exposed network with vulnerabilities that has already been exploited by a, a, a hacker. Wh whatever hat they might be wearing at the time, obviously, if they're doing it without your knowledge, it's going to be nefarious. And part of the, the, the hacking methodology is always to put a backdoor in. So they may not have actually uh, delivered a payload. They may not have actually done anything disruptive on your net. But what they've done is they've um, seated and placed a means to get in to back into your network with ease and efficiently. And that's generally what's sold on the dark and deep web to threat actors that may have a, a desire to, to breach and conduct an attack on your specific organization. I mean, there's a, a, a vast yeah. amount of organizations that are already compromised. They don't, they may not know it. They may assess it and they may be um, monitoring that on whatever risk register um, and, and either accepting it, controlling it in, in, in whatever way. But there are there will be a lot of organisations out there that are already compromised. They just don't know it um, until they're subject to a to an attack. Um, and well, yeah, this, this is where continuous pen testing comes in. Well, this is it because I mean we've seen a shift in ISO twenty you know the, the newest version of ISO twenty seven thousand and one where there's a requirement now for intelligence. You know, um, and I, I was talking with uh, some guys about that on one of the other podcast recordings, which. Are, you know, probably go live in the next couple of weeks. Um, and we were saying, you know, this is this is where the market is going, you know, on-demand intelligence, on-demand knowledge of where where you are at any one time. Um, you know, cyber liability insurance, we've mentioned it a couple of times. I think a lot of that and the, and the reduction of the premiums and keeping your premiums as low as possible is going to hinge on proof that you are, actively doing some kind of active monitoring and active intelligence gathering as well because you know there's a number of really good organizations out there who who do intelligence um and having them keeping an eye out on the dark web on some of the more difficult boards to find um unless you're a denizen of the uh, of the deep dark um you know we're looking at the simple fact that that if, if you want to keep the costs low for things like cyber insurance, you're going to have to do this. Um, we're going to see more and more frameworks adopting that consistent ongoing security and assurance. And I think that's what it's going to probably wind up being called, you know, ongoing security assurance. Um, obviously, ISO has gone down that route by, by requiring intelligence, which you can do yourself or you can buy in a tool that will help you do that. Uh, but I think continuous testing is going to come in. I mean, we've already seen two-factor authentication, as we used to call it years ago, become multi-factor authentication. And we're seeing a lot of these frameworks requiring at minimum multi-factor authentication. Um, I mean, I've been an advocate of multi-factor for quite a while now because, you know, as far as I'm concerned, passwords of, of any, you know, the, the same size that most people tend to use, which is the barest minimum, um, tends to get cracked relatively quickly and easily now, or sort of circumvented completely. So I don't know, I think we're going through this massive transitionary stage. And I think we I think there's a lot of organizations that don't know what to do because they got to update. They have to they have to move with the times. They have to move with where security is going. Otherwise they're going to wind up like <coughs> the Royal Mail um, and various other companies that have been in the news and reported to have been taken advantage of. And, and I think this is what definitely um, comes back to the, because 
I know, uh, Jim, you've put together kind of your iceberg model of threat intelligence. Oh, sorry, not threat intelligence, defence in depth, I should say. So bringing it back to the original conversation of defence in depth is that you've obviously got multiple layers. I mean, we may not be able to show it here, but you've got multiple layers within your kind of defence in depth model, iceberg model. And the last layer is obviously the intelligence layer. And this is the literally the last line of defence. Um, and intelligence is is where it, you turn it into a cyclical nature, is that you are kind of trying to find consistent inten- intelligence, whether that be through, you know, testing, continuous testing, pen testing, dark web monitoring, et cetera, et cetera, that can feed all of the corrections and remediation to the back top of this uh, kind of defense in depth and let it filter through. So you're, you're kind of, you know, you, the intelligence is definitely, first of all, your last line of defense by shoring up vulnerabilities higher up in the you know higher right, up so in I, I would counter that jamie uh i mean co- cognizant of my my background um where intelligence is utilized um pretty much at the very beginning of any decision making process i mean certainly within the combat estimate um i mean question one is is pr- all about finding out about who's who is your adversary what are my current capabilities who am i what are my adversary's capabilities what's the demographics what's the the um the topology of the the, the local environment um so intelligence provides the basis of every decision making process that you make thereafter so i'd argue that intelligence needs to be that first run because yeah, no, what you, i'm saying is uh, what i was trying to get at is it it's the part of it that you should start with and end with so you're doing a continuous cycle cycle basically is what i was trying to get to eventually but yes now i agree you should always not only is it your last ditch there's something to rely on to make sure that you've you should have done it first in the first place yeah but yes no I well i disagree agree. with all of you no. um <laughs> well that's just your to be controversial <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> I think intelligence in in the security space is going to permeate at every level of that defense in depth model. And I think what will happen is we have to really update it because I don't think the layering model necessarily is fully correct anymore. We have elements of, of intelligence and of security and assurance and continuous testing and, you know... Uh, items that need to be done on a regular basis that kind of permeate through each one of those levels. So I think what you'll find is, you know, our traditional defence in depth that we represent on an iceberg, you know, starts off with the very visible stuff like policies, procedures and all the rest of it. That's that's the top of the iceberg that you could normally see. Then you have kind of like at the water level, that's where your perimeter stuff sits for your usually for your network and then all the other functions are underneath because as we know an iceberg is a massive massive chunk of ice that you only ever see the right at the tip of but i think we're going to have to shift that model to the side a bit and then there's going to be a bar all the way down through all of those layers that accompanies assurance you know security assurance and that will make up um you know that will be made up of intelligence that will be made up of, um, you know, testing measures. And I think, um, you know, not only are we going to be doing or, or it's going to be recommended to do continuous testing of things like perimeter infrastructure, web applications and, and publicly available assets. Sorry if you can hear that background. Someone's obviously in trouble. Um, and you'll get it in stereo because Jamie's only next door. But um, in, uh, what was I saying? yes. It's also going to include things like um, testing of your the effectiveness of your solutions, testing of the effectiveness of your checks and balances and tests that you do. It's already part of a lot of a lot of you know requirements within, for instance, ISO and PCI DSS. Within PCI DSS, it's a slightly different thing because there's different dispensations depending upon if you're a circ- you know, service provider or whether you're not. But one of the things that we're seeing I'm, or I'm seeing a lot of noise about is third-party testing and making sure that your supply chain and the supply chain of your supply chain and so on and so forth is secure all the way through by design throughout the links. Now, the only way you're going to be able to do that 
Because let's face it, there's going to be tons of resource required in order to meet those objectives, not only technologically speaking, but we're talking legally speaking. You've got to have the right contracts. You've got to make sure that your service providers are providing you with assurance that they're doing what they need to be doing at the similar kind of level that you are. And I think security has become a massively complex model now. Um, and we, this is why we need to sit down and rethink um, and maybe that's an exercise for us to to sit down at some point with our consultants and pen testers, pretty much everybody. Oh, here we go again. There's, someone's going past again. Um, you know, where we need to sit down and honestly look and say, right, the world has shifted, the world has changed. You know, our, our defense in depth models were based around securing one or a small amount of environments. You know, what are we doing for the security of people's people working from home? They're using wireless. They're using insecure wireless because, I mean, I don't believe the the Kool Aid that uh, that uh, <laughs> our beloved in the UK BT tell you with its most secure wireless router on the planet. No, it's not. I've got people who can crack that in less times than it takes me to drink this drink. Um, you know, and I think that's that's where we're going. I think I think we've very much broken out of, uh, you know, in the business world of being a, you know, a, a, a branch of IT, which I think is a long time coming, and now being seen as very much um, a department in itself. And I'm seeing a lot of, you know, in a lot of our customers, the larger customers where they have legal departments, where they have finance departments, you know, a lot of them are, uh, you know, getting support from, funnily enough, legal and finance saying, well, you know, because they're used to legislation, let's face it, they they have to deal with it on a daily basis, but they're providing a lot of support now for CISOs and security groups to, to be shifted from uh, IT completely now. No dotted lines, no nothing, their own department in itself. And you're going to see a lot more compliance as well going in that direction into that group. It's going to, it's going to almost be InfoSec departments are going to be the kind of the police of the company. So I hate to use that term because there's a lot of negative connotations to that in, in the view of some people's eyes. But, you know, you've got to have an enforcement group who can sit there and actually look at what's going on around the company and, and uh, you know, deal with it. Yeah. I mean, going back, going on to like the, uh, just briefly touching on the vendor stuff, I, I, I could talk forever for vendor stuff. And you talk, Jim, about kind of like going down the PCI, uh, the PCI DSS requirement, making sure that your vendor is secure as, as well as your vendor's vendors are secure. I mean, you can only, it, it's becoming t- to a point where there's an untenable situation and eventually someone will come up with some solution to this. But the amount of resources, both people and technology and everything else like that, going into ensuring that your vendors are secure, they're providing a secure service, they're certified or whatever the case may be, in providing, you know, they're certified in security to provide those services and products and solutions securely is becoming fairly untenable fairly quickly, especially when you're starting to have to go to not only third parties, but fourth parties and fifth parties. Um, I've got a lot to potentially say about that because it's one of my area of expertise. But yes, it's it's definitely... It's definitely something that needs to be looked at and maybe it'll be another a topic for another day, but yeah. Tom, just out of interest, what how do the military ensure security through their supply chain? Because it's very different with with supplies to the military, isn't it? Because I mean you've got obviously you've got manufacturers who manufacture the various different kit that you use, but you do get a lot of other institutions providing various different types of support, be it IT support, be it um, supplying of kit from, you know, technical technical items, um, you know, whatever it is. How do they, because they've got the DART system, haven't they? Yeah, so, um, I mean, naturally, the, the military, they, they like to do things quite diligently. Um, so any third party contractors that they utilize either for a service or for a, um, an asset or item procurement chain, um, whether it be for a larger project for a, a main piece of equipment um, or whether it be for, for basic infrastructure like laptops and stuff like that, 
I mean, over the last couple of years, they went through a massive um, IT upgrade where uh, ev- every employee now that requires one is given a laptop. Um, and that obviously, that was in the pipeline, believe it or not, before COVID uh, lockdown. So when lockdown hit, we were already in the, the process of um, starting to to roll that out. So the military actually transitions to, to working from home relatively well. Um, so biz- uh, normal business processes could actually continue. But going back to sort of supplier assurance, it's um, they, they have a, an organisation called CIDA um, that basically oversees all risk balance cases conducted for essentially a, a third party assurance um, chain. So a, any organisation or any contractor that wants to uh, provide a service, provide um, or, or um, comply or act on a, a, co- a military contract, they need to go through CIDA. Um, conduct or submit a risk balance case um, to get their information um, control technology registered on the DART system. Um, And until it's registered on the DART, they won't be able to um, facilitate the the terms of their their contract or even uh, be in a position to bid for that contract. One of the minimum requirements I believe they have is they have to be cyber essentials. Uh, Obviously, NCSC uh, being the main forerunner and controller of that, um, can obviously provide guidance, go onto the website to, to see what the uh, the requirements are for that. But utilising, um, obviously, consultancies, if, if you haven't got any dedicated information security personnel within your organisation, can aid with that, they can help. Now, it's not an overnight process. There is obviously things that need to happen to make sure that internal processes are in place, infrastructure is in place, so that you can have every success or chance of success in gaining that certification. Um, but yeah, it's um, they, they do make sure that anybody that has a level of impact, whether it be third party uh, contracted services or suppliers, um, are, are vetted appropriately and they, um, they protect defence identifiable information in the best possible way, reducing those risks to residual risk only. And that is one of their main stipulations. Uh, I mean, certainly moving on to this year, from July of this year, they are enacting a secure by design uh, methodology where any contractors or any organisations that want to bid for contracts moving forwards have to be secured by design, not secured by afterthought and bolt on. So it's it's actually quite progressive, the, the line that they're taking. So it'll be very interesting to see how much of an impact that has on, on the commercial world, especially those that are linked or providing services to the military and government. And I think that, and, and I'm sorry, and I think that specifically brings us back like almost full circle that we have, you know, putting into secure by design, getting the intelligence first or making that the center of this new defense in depth model is key. I think people should start and or, and or build around intelligence with a new defense in depth model that we've kind of discussed and we worked ourselves around. And building that intelligence in is basically bringing that in first and performing it by design. So, I mean, I'm going to ask a question potentially to end on, but what is that our, is that our guidance? Is that our advice to uh, companies out there maybe considering where to start with this or, you know, um, re-evaluating their def- own defence in depth or how they, how they see it? What are, we, what are we actually advising them to do? To start with intelligence, go uh, start the whole process well from, you know from by design rather than bolting in afterwards or getting the intelligence and building around it you have to have a solid understanding of the intelligence cycle though to start with that so the intelligence cycle is direction collation analysis dissemination um obviously the the uh, the start in yes we want to build a new ict infrastructure or, or segmented network um to, to be able to perform X, Y, and Z. Um, the collation stage, for example, would be a workshop. Get all the required stakeholders or dual represent, uh, representatives from those departments into a, a five, 10 day workshop and say, right, what is it that we need to do? What do we need to achieve? And what are the requirements? That is your information collect phase. You then process it. So once you've got all that information, you do your link analysis, um, your requirements, for what that segmented network needs to be is your intelligence. You then pipe that out to the required entities that are then going to design this and implement this design to then put forward. And then the intelligence cycle starts again. 
all the way through the dev process, all the way through the enactment, and then the then execution of, of that process or or design. The intelligent cycle is constant, um, but you have to start from basic information collect, process that, and then you get intelligence. And I think in some spheres, there's a confusion about what information actually is and intelligence is because they're confusing the two. I think it's just gotten to the point now where you can't afford to have somebody who's not an information security professional really even begin to secure your environment. I think it's gotten too complex now. Uh, don't get me wrong, I think there's a lot of very, very good IT people out there, but I don't think it's, it's anywhere near as simple. And I think you're right. I think the intelligence factor of, you know, the first factor really is getting getting somebody involved who knows what they're doing. I think that's the best, best possible thing you can do. And that's not a shameless plug for our services, although we can provide those if you wish. Um, it's It's very much a case of, Security has got so complicated with the implications so wide and so so potentially damaging now. I, I don't think you're able to, to to do anything but get that professional in if you're starting from scratch. And if you're not starting from scratch and you're an InfoSec sort of professional who's been working to the same strategy for a while now, I think it's time to really sit down and actually re-review what you're, what you're doing, where the trends are in the market. Because I, I think, you know, the trends are changing dramatically, um, but anyway, top, we're at the top of the top of the hour now, um, and I think uh, we'll leave it there. But I think next time I want to talk about the changes in attacks and how they're changing. Again, I talk to a lot of people for the podcast. We've got a lot of different guests. And some of the intelligence guys have started to to worry about deep fakes now and the and the possibility of of ransoming of individuals not the the ransoming that we're talking about with ransomware but actually ransomwareing them with deep fake videos of their wives or their or their husbands or their kids or whatever so it's it's quite mind blowing but we'll we'll talk about that next time so Thank you guys for uh, for another good session, um, and thank you out there for uh, watching. Um, please feel free to subscribe, uh, leave us a comment through the various different methods and channels that we've got open to us, either via LinkedIn or through any comments and what have you. This should be going up on the uh, the actual YouTube channel. So we'll be speaking again soon, and we'll be having a chat with. Uh, Tom and Jamie and maybe some other guys as well, you know, relatively shortly. Speak to you all soon and look after yourselves. Goodbye.